Why do doctors give you a pill instead of talking to you about lifestyle? And whose fault is it? Do you ever wonder why doctors just give you a prescription to treat a chronic disease without talking to you about specific lifestyle changes you need to make? As an ob doc who saw 40 patients a day, and as a patient who sat in countless waiting rooms waiting for doctors, and as a healthcare administrator who witnessed the pressure doctors are increasingly under, I think I know the answer. But before you jump to any conclusions, hear me out. You're listening to Healthy Looks Great on You, a lifestyle medicine podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Vicki Petz Casper. For two decades, I practiced as a board-certified obstetrician-gynecologist, navigating the complex world of women's health. But life took an unexpected turn when my own health failed. Emerging on the other side, I discovered the transformative power of lifestyle medicine. Now, I'm on a mission to share its incredible benefits with you. So buckle up, because we are going on a journey to our very own mini medical school, where you will learn how lifestyle medicine can help prevent, treat, and sometimes even reverse disease. This is episode 120. Why don't doctors prescribe lifestyle changes instead of a pill? Healthy Looks Great on You has now published 19 episodes on various topics and how they relate to lifestyle medicine. But even if you've listened to every episode, you may still be wondering exactly what is lifestyle medicine? Now is a really good time to ask because it's Lifestyle Medicine Week. So let's celebrate. The American College of Lifestyle Medicine is 20 years old. That's right, 20 years, with over 10,000 members and 2,000 board-certified providers. I'm excited to be one of them, but I also know how it feels to practice medicine in a traditional setting, also to be a patient, receiving care in a traditional setting, and observe other doctors provide care in a traditional setting. So I can give you some inside information about why doctors are more likely to write a prescription than help you with lifestyle modifications. And why should you even care about lifestyle medicine? Maybe you care about health or aging or health care or finances or even our country's future. And whose fault is it that doctors prescribe first and then counsel? Well, maybe they even never get around to counseling. They should but I think I know why they don't. Let me give you some quotes directly from the American College of Lifestyle Medicine website. And if you want to read more for yourself, there's a link in the show notes. Chronic disease is the leading cause of death and disability in the United States. Rates of chronic disease have never been higher, with the cost of chronic conditions eating up 86% of all healthcare dollars spent. Chronic disease is so common that more than half of U.S. adults have at least one condition, accounting for 90% of healthcare spending. According to the World Health Organization, 80% of heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, and 40% of cancer could be prevented, primarily with improvements to diet and lifestyle. The United States spends at least 18% of its GDP, which is $3.35 trillion, on health expenditures. If costs continue to rise, by 2050, Medicare and Medicaid alone will account for 20% of the GDP. All projections point to continued rises in chronic disease. If we don't reverse this trend, we are headed for bankruptcy as a country. The solvency of our nation is at stake. Health matters to individuals, to families, to our nation, and to the world. And lifestyle is the foundation for health. The American College of Lifestyle Medicine describes itself as a society of medical professionals united to reverse chronic disease. Now, let me stop for just a minute and talk about medical school. Not mini medical school, but real medical school. You know, the one that requires a high GPA from a four-year college degree and a high score on a rigorous entrance exam called the MCAT just to get in. Then four years of medical school where you dissect cadavers and learn to auscultate and palpate. 
A doctor I greatly respected told me before I started medical school that if you drop your pencil, you'll be two weeks behind when you pick it up. Of course, times have changed, and I doubt there are too many number twos in the classroom to sharpen lead and knowledge, but you get it. We were told on the first day that only two-thirds would graduate, and it was true. We were also told that the vocabulary we would learn would be the equivalent of learning a foreign language, and that was true too. Most medical terms have a Latin root, so it's not like it's words you already know. Then when you graduate, you can put MD or DO behind your name, but you're not done yet. After that is residency training, and depending on your specialty, it can last three to 13 years. Meanwhile, your friends start their careers and you're still in school. But health is a precious thing to be trusted with, so it's worth every second. I delivered 5,000 babies during my career, and I always say there is nothing more precious than the feel of newborn baby feet except the look in a mother's eyes when she touches them for the first time. But so much has changed since I graduated. Let me get my Geritol before I say this out loud, but the internet didn't even exist until after I was in practice. And cell phones, well, they were these great big things that came in bags that you could plug into the cigarette lighter. All that was more than 20 years ago. When I was in school, want to know how much training we got in nutrition? Eh, about 10 minutes, probably. And for fitness? Well, I mean, we all study physiology, but you seriously don't want to know how, and I'm not going to tell you, and that's about it. Nothing on social connectedness. And who had time for it anyway? All we did was study. Sleep deprivation was part of the curriculum, and stress, well, it was through the roof on a normal day. But we did learn a lot about harmful substances. You know, fast food on the run, alcohol after exams, and malted milk balls for all-night studying during exam week. It's a wonder we even survived. And now things are different. Hours are limited, and all the new doctors get training in lifestyle medicine and graduate all healthy and... No? No? Oh, wait, no. They still don't get enough training, and many doctors don't set a good example, including me when I ate that dessert at Bunko last week. Ugh. Okay, so here's what is different. The internet gives doctors access to the most up-to-date recommendations. Often, lifestyle modification is number one on the list. And there's a mandate that medical schools teach a minimum of 25 hours on nutrition. Yeah, but it still gets squeezed out. And that's pathologic. Okay, let's go to mini medical school now and talk about some pathology. Lifestyle factors account for the root of many diseases, such as dementia, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, heart disease, and cancer. Not only do we have the internet, we carry it around with us. And not just doctors, but patients who Google their symptoms, conclude they are dying, and call the doctor's office for an appointment to confirm their worst fears. Now, here's where the snowball really starts rolling. You've Googled your symptoms, and you know your disease is fatal if not treated immediately. But Dr. Flesh and Blood is booked, seeing other patients referred by Dr. Google. So, the next available appointment is next month, but that's too late. You'll be dead by then. So, what are you going to do? Plan your funeral or beg the nurse to work you in? What? Oh, I thought that's what you said. See, Dr. Flesh and Blood already has a full schedule. But since your symptoms are so urgent and your disease is progressing while you're waiting with phone in hand for the nurse to call you back, then finally you are successfully added to a time slot that was already occupied. And by the way, this didn't just happen once today or tomorrow. It happened every time the search engine chugged out of the station. So... While Dr. Flesh and Blood is reassuring that Dr. Google made a mistake, the patients in the waiting room are developing hypertension because it's 2 p.m. and their appointment's at 1 and they got here at 12.15 and now they've been waiting for nearly two hours. Listen, this is all supposed to be tongue-in-cheek, but it's also reality. I lived it for a couple of decades on both sides of the equation. Now, after Dr. Flesh and Blood does an exam and some tests and determines that you have a disease that's caused by hamburgers, late-night Netflix, cell phone addiction, and indentions in the couch cushions, what is he or she supposed to do? Ah, I have an idea. 
give you a quick fix so you don't have to change anything and he or she can get to the next patient in the next exam room who also has an urgent medical problem that won't be easy to fix. Now, whose fault is it? Maybe mine, maybe yours, and maybe no one's. It is what it is. But instead of casting blame, let's explore solutions. Lifestyle medicine is a field of medicine whose time has come. I'll give you another quote from the American College of Lifestyle Medicine website. Lifestyle medicine is a medical specialty that uses therapeutic lifestyle interventions as a primary modality to treat chronic conditions including, but not limited to, cardiovascular diseases, type 2 diabetes, and obesity. Lifestyle medicine certified clinicians are trained to apply evidence-based, whole-person, prescriptive lifestyle change to treat and when used intensively, often reverse such conditions. Applying the six pillars of lifestyle medicine, a whole food plant predominant eating pattern, physical activity, restorative sleep, stress management, avoidance of risky substances, and positive social connections also provides effective prevention for these conditions. Now, I need to back up a minute and tell you what happens after residency. Boards. Hopefully you aren't bored yet, but I meant boards, B-O-A-R-D-S. Depending on, the, depending on the specialty, after residency, there's a written test followed by practicing medicine for a year or so and keeping case logs, then oral boards. It's so much fun. They put you in a room with all of the prestigious doctors who wrote the textbooks, and then they grill you on illnesses you'll probably never see. And if you don't pass, then sometimes you can't get credentialed with hospitals or insurance companies. You also have to pay a lot of money to do it. That's another part of the equation. But the American Board of Medical Specialties is the one who governs this process, and it's pretty darn expensive for doctors to prove that they know how to treat you better than Dr. Google. So what does all of this have to do with lifestyle medicine? Well, in order to be board certified by the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine, you have to be certified in an American Board of Medical Specialties recognized specialty. Like for me, that's OBGYN. Then you can go through the curriculum, the education, and the board exam to be American Board of Lifestyle Medicine certified. And you're probably wondering why all of that matters, but it does. You see, lifestyle medicine is not functional medicine or complementary medicine or alternative medicine. It is a subspecialty of conventional medicine, research proven and data driven. And it's high time lifestyle medicine came to the forefront. Otherwise, Dr. Flesh and Blood would just keep cranking out prescriptions and feed big pharma. Time out. I take three prescription medications and two of them I cannot live without. One is generic and cheap, and I'm collecting donations to pay for the other one. Lifestyle medicine is not anti-medications. Then what is it? For many diagnoses, the first-line recommendation is lifestyle modification. You know, your doctor will say, lose weight, exercise, quit smoking, and manage your stress. That's it. Poof, you're well now, right? No? What's wrong? Are you saying that wasn't enough to make a difference? But seriously, what is your doctor supposed to do? Well, we all know that in the real world, losing weight and all that other stuff isn't really that easy, is it? Besides, how do you lose weight, start exercising, quit smoking, and manage your stress? Seems like some big ask without any tools to implement those changes. I have a one-week mini course to help you get started with lifestyle changes. It includes a downloadable workbook, and it's all free, and there's a sign-up link on my website, and I'll add that to the show notes. I'd also like to think that listening to this podcast will help you too, so sign up to get every episode in your inbox so you don't miss anything. All six pillars of lifestyle medicine are so important in preventing disease, treating conditions, and sometimes even curing those conditions, and trust me, I understand it's not easy. But I hope this podcast will help you start making changes that make a difference in your overall health. So let's review in a little more detail. Before we move on, a word from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Equilibrium Medical, a telehealth lifestyle medical practice. Are you tired of taking medicine without making changes that make a difference in your health? 
If you live in Arkansas or Tennessee, visit www.equilibriumtelehealth.com today and schedule an appointment from the comfort of your own home. I'm so excited about Equilibrium Medical, a telehealth practice solely dedicated to the practice of lifestyle medicine. Now let's review those six pillars. First, sleep. Poor sleep affects your concentration, memory, and mood. It stresses your immune system and keeps you from processing fears and stress, not to mention the risk of high blood pressure, heart disease, stroke, cancer, dementia, and obesity. Now, let me ask you a question. Without bringing it up, how often has your doctor asked you about your quantity or quality of sleep? I mean, they might have if you went in complaining of fatigue or signs of sleep apnea, but what if you're overweight? The risk of obesity may be increased by a whopping 41% by inadequate sleep. And if you're having trouble sleeping, your doctor will probably recommend good sleep hygiene. You know, keep the room cool, quiet, and dark, turn off screens, and limit caffeine. And those are super important to get restorative sleep. But once you already have insomnia, sleep hygiene doesn't work. There will be an upcoming episode focused on insomnia, so stay tuned. But what's the next step? they might give you a sleeping pill. And really, those are not good. Next is social connectedness. Your doctor might have asked you about sleep, but did they ever, ever, ever mention social isolation as a metric for poor health? Loneliness has been declared an epidemic affecting one in two adults. Research consistently shows that social isolation has a huge negative impact on your health. Recently, there was a study that looked at super-agers. You know, those elderly folks that are full of vim and vigor and sharp as attack. The results were a little surprising. Some of them smoked. Some of them drank alcohol on a regular basis. Some ate junk food. Now, nearly all of them exercised in midlife, but the one thing they all had in common was robust relationships. Social isolation and loneliness are detrimental to your health as much as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And since I mentioned smoking, let's move on to number three, exposure to harmful substances like alcohol and tobacco. I'm pretty sure anyone who wants to quit or cut back understands how difficult this can be. I remember patients who were concerned about the amount of alcohol they were drinking. And guess what I did? I checked their liver enzymes, and if they were okay, I, 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 I didn't do anything else because I didn't know what else to do. Now I would say the first step in recovery is to plug into a recovery group. Alcoholics Anonymous or Celebrate Recovery are the key to dealing with addiction to alcohol, and 1-800-QUIT-NOW can help you stop smoking just by giving you an accountability tool. Now, Celebrate Recovery is actually for anyone with hurts, habits, and hang-ups, and that pretty much covers all of us. As always, there are resources available, and I put those links on my website. Turns out if you have a bad habit, it's very unlikely you can overcome it on your own. C number two, social isolation. And this is where I mentioned number four, stress management. Chronic stress and Early stress in life can lead to bad habits, whether that's smoking, drinking, eating, sugar, staying up late, binging on Netflix. It's all terrible for your health. What are you supposed to do? Get a grip? No, it's not that easy, and you know it. First of all, be intentional about managing your stress because either you manage your stress or it will manage you. And stress is inevitable. So start moving more because one of the most effective stress reducers is physical activity. Time in nature is also super effective. According to the first chapter of Romans, it reveals the attributes of God. So get out and soak up some sunshine. Art and creativity are great ways to manage stress too. I like to sing. I didn't say I was good at it, but it's good for me. I wasn't born with the ability to carry a tune. But you can't always get what you want. But if you try sometimes, you just might find you get what you need. And what we all need is to move more. Number five is physical fitness. This one is so important for your health, and it's easy to improve if you understand what it looks like. Physical fitness doesn't mean you have to go to the gym five days a week and sweat off a couple of pounds. Maybe it simply means standing instead of sitting. That's moving more. 
unless you have a severe physical disability, and trust me, I've been there, but most people can move more. When my mom was young, her doctor told her, always take the stairs instead of the elevator and always find a parking place far away instead of jockeying for one near the door and never ever drive to the mailbox, always walk. And these small steps done over a lifetime add up. And remember, the cool thing about physical activity is the benefits start immediately. All this other stuff takes time. And that brings us to the final pillar, nutrition. To me, I think this is the hardest one. And the reason I struggle with it is because, you know, we just live on the go and we eat on the run. And guess what? Restaurants are interested in pleasing your palate, not your waistline. And here's the deal. It's so important. The American College of Lifestyle Medicine promotes a plant-predominant diet. That doesn't mean completely vegetarian, but just eat more plants and get most of your calories from fruits and nuts and seeds and veggies and whole grains. And if you're looking for recipes and wondering what to eat, you'll be happy to know I have an upcoming episode from someone with tons of recipes. So stay tuned to the podcast. And if you're struggling, just try to cut back on your meat a little here or there. A lot of people do Meatless Monday or just eliminate meat from your lunches. If you eat meat every day for lunch and stop that just five days a week, you've significantly reduced your intake. Give it a try. Lifestyle changes aren't easy because change is always hard, but it's worth it to be healthy and healthy looks great on you. The information contained in this podcast is for educational purposes only and is not considered to be a substitute for medical advice. You should continue to follow up with your physician or healthcare provider and take medication as prescribed. Though the information in this podcast is evidence-based, new research may develop and recommendations may change.